Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. I wanted to just speak a little bit about women in ministry tonight because it is a bit of a controversial issue. So I thought it would be advantageous for me as the mom in this house just to share a few thoughts with you about leadership and about what we do at the Rock and what we believe. Are you okay with that? And prayerfully, there'll be things that you can take home tonight, questions that might be answered. So if you would just stand with me, let's go before the Lord. Father, we thank you for the privilege of coming into your presence. May we never take it lightly, Lord, that we have access to the very throne of power in the universe, the King of glory. And Lord, we bow our heads in humility and in gratefulness tonight. And Lord, as you have told us that you set into place in your body pastors and teachers and evangelists and apostles and prophets, that you give gifts to men that you may perfect your people through the leadership of those that you've chosen to serve. Lord, we thank you that you tend the church and that you tend the flame of the church, that you tend us and that you are the chief shepherd of this house. So, Lord, we ask tonight that as we open your word, that you would open our eyes. We thank you for men and women here, Lord, that love you, love your house, love your people. May we be a family in these times that are uncertain, Lord, that hold steady. May we be a family that isn't shaken or rocked by the affairs of men or the things that are coming upon the earth. May we be a family that is filled with joy and hope and faith. And may we be a family that embraces all that you have for us and invites those that need a family into the house of God. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all the saints of God said, amen. Amen. Tonight, we're going to ordain Pastor Joanna. She will be Pastor Joanna and Pastor Tracy. But before we do... I want to, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to a scripture. And I don't have this on the overhead. It's just popped into my heart. So I'm trying to find the address very quickly. And if I can't find it, we won't do it. But I wanted to talk to you about the house of God for just a minute. Because the church of God is the house of God. And we are his family, we are his people, we are his temple individually and collectively, and we are the pillar of truth according to the word of God. Which means that people that don't know Jesus can come into this community of believers and they can find Jesus Christ and see the light of the gospel in our lives. We're a family. How many of you have families right now? Do any of your families ever fight? How many have never had a fight in their family? Let me see your hands. Ah, doesn't exist, does it? Why? Because we're human. And because God has worked it so that in the very nature of the family, that we're going to work out something wonderful called the love walk. And that the very nature of men and women being married, I mean, how many of you are married in here? And just the very nature of a man and a woman coming together and becoming one and creating a family is a miracle. Because men and women, although we are cut out of the same cloth, are extremely different. How many of you have never had a fight in your marriage? Yeah, see, it doesn't exist. Of course you have. But God has allowed these things, and he's, he knows what's going on, and he's working something out in us. Well, it's the same thing in the church. In the local church, we're God's family. And there's many wonderful churches, and every week my husband gets on his knees and prays for the churches in the Inland Empire. And we are a part of the great company of believers in California and in the United States and on this planet in this generation. But we are, at The Rock, a particular family. And just like your family has its traditions, you have your special holidays and you celebrate Christmas a certain way, you celebrate Easter a certain way, you celebrate birthdays a certain way, you have traditions from culture, you have traditions that you've established as your own families. Here at The Rock, we have our own traditions and our own rock culture. And so 
when we ordain and when we set in place people here that are going to be ministers of the gospel at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center, they are people that we have known for a long time. People that have proven themselves, that have proven that they are able to handle themselves in the house of God and they are able to serve the house of God and they are able to do certain things. They've already passed a lot of tests. And so tonight we are going to ordain two women. Now, there's a controversy in the body of Christ about women in ministry. At The Rock, we have an incredible freedom here for women. The, the men of God at The Rock Church and World Outreach Center, my husband, of course, being the senior pastor, and Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke and Pastor Joel and all the pastors here, they are of the belief, as we have studied the Word of God together, that there is freedom in the kingdom of God and that women are called alongside of men to serve in the house of God. And I realize that outside of the rock culture that there are some great churches, good churches, that argue that women have no place in ministry. And we know the verses, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, let your women keep silent in the church for it is shameful for a woman to speak. And we know that in Timothy, God says that he doesn't allow a woman to be ordained or to usurp authority or to teach men. And so those two scriptures have really shackled women in the body of Christ and kept women outside of the ordination and the service of God and the house of God. But here at The Rock, because we have studied the scriptures and we have sought these things, we have saw that there is another side to that story. And I know, have, have any of you ever had that controversy of women in ministry? I'm just curious. Anybody ever asked or ever thought about it? How many of you really don't care? All right. Well, that's, no, this is just, we're having a conversation. Tonight. We're having a chat. Is that all right? But we should care because it's the word of God. And we want to make sure that we're not in error and that we're doing things decently and in order. So I'd like to just take you on just a brief journey tonight about womanhood and about her place and her place alongside of men, since we are ordaining to women tonight and we're going to introduce pastors that we've already ordained and introduce them to you. Men, there's no controversy over. It's the women in the house that have the controversy. And so having said that, I'd like to just give you a couple of scriptures tonight and then we're going to go ahead with the ordination. Is that all right? So can, you just, can we just have a, a family chat as we watch Jesus do something miraculous tonight? All right, good. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 16, if I can have that up on the overhead. When the church went and waited in the upper room and the Holy Spirit came and they, there was 120 of them, male and female, waiting in the upper room. Jesus said, tarry in Jerusalem until the power from on high is sent to you, the Holy Spirit. And they were up in that upper room and they tarried and they waited and they waited and they prayed. And the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2 as a mighty rushing wind. And they didn't know what to think because they thought they were drunk. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. And the book of Acts chapter 2, Peter is accused of being drunk. And the men are accused of being drunk. And he says, no, we're not drunk. This is the new wine that was prophesied by the prophet Joel in the Old Testament. And in Acts chapter 2... Peter says this, but this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Well, that word prophesy, and that word prophecy in the Greek means to foretell or to foretell. It means to speak the oracles of God. It means to declare the work of God. It means to speak the word of God. And so when God sent the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts to the 120 that were sitting up there, and there were men and women up there, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to prophesy, and they began to speak the oracles of God, and they began to speak in other tongues. And what this was, was God was making a statement. 
He was saying that there's a whole new dispensation. There is a whole new covenant that has come in. There was an old covenant and there was the law, but I have fulfilled the law on the cross. And behold, I have resurrected and I have risen. I am now in you. I am sending the Spirit of God into you, each and every one of you individually. And he will be with you corporately. We're in a corporate anointing like this. You can believe for signs, wonders, healings, and gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why to come to church and to see God move in this in this type of an atmosphere is wonderful because you can see the Holy Spirit and be with the Holy Spirit by yourself of course but when you come into the house of God you come into the very gateway of heaven and earth and God moves corporately in the anointing as we gather together in faith so here we see men and women prophesying and speaking on your men servants and your maid servants I will pour out my spirit in those days in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, it says that there is neither, and if I can have that up on the overhead, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Here's another scripture. The Holy Spirit came, and he didn't just fill the men. He filled the men and the women. And now Paul is writing to the, to the province of Galatia. And he's saying, listen, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's not the ones that are the apple of God's eye, the old covenant Jew, and the Gentile, the Greek, who is outside the covenant and alienated from God. Now you are all one in Christ Jesus. There is neither male nor female. There is neither bond nor free. In other words, God covers the social economic systems of this world and makes it a level playing field for everyone. He covers the gender prejudice and makes it a level playing field. And he causes the racial prejudice and he makes it a level playing field. And he makes out of two races, the Jew and the Gentile, which is everybody else, one new man, so making peace, according to the book of Ephesians. Beloved, we are not black or white. We are not rich and poor. We are not all of these things. We are now, you and I, if we are born of the Spirit of God, we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son, and we are a new creation. We are what has never been before, and there is neither male nor female before God in the spirit realm, and a woman before the throne of God and a man before the throne of God have equal privilege and equal equal rights before God there is a level playing field now before the throne of God and in this world there will never be a level playing field never there will always be the haves and the have-nots always but in the kingdom of God where you and I are there is now a level playing field and it's by faith that works through grace that works by love that gets what we need in this world are you hearing what I'm saying so if that's true, then why is it that women are not welcomed into the ministry alongside of men? Well, I said those two scriptures have seemed to stop much of the body of Christ, but let's just dig a little deeper. Now, in the Old Testament, God says, let everything be established by, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let everything be established. So when the Word of God seems to contradict itself, then we've got to dig just a little bit deeper to see if this is true by the laws of interpretation because Scripture interprets Scripture. Are you with me? Now, I'm not going to go into those two Scriptures tonight because we don't have time. But I want to give you just a couple of examples of God using women in the Old Covenant before we had all this new privilege, before we could even get to the throne of God. Remember, most of us here are not Jewish. We were Gentiles, and that means we were outside of any promise of God, and we didn't know God. It was through the Jew that salvation came. That's why Jesus was Jewish. So in the Old Testament, looking at the history, his story, the Old Testament, we see two women that were mightily used of God when God could have used a man. Number one was Deborah. Deborah was a judge in Israel. When Israel was on a long drift from God, what Israel did is Israel would serve God, and God would bless them, and then they would backslide and go into idolatry, and then their enemies would overtake them. And then they would cry out to God, and God would raise up a judge. There'd be a battle. The battle would be won, and that judge would judge Israel, and Israel would have peace then for a number of years. It's called judges. And 
Deborah was one of the judges that God raised up. Now, Deborah was not just a, what we would call a Supreme Court judge. She was married. She was a judge in Israel. But she was also a military general because she led Barak into a battle that Barak would not go into without her. And so I just wanted to show this to you. In Deborah, if we're looking at, we're looking at women in ministry, in 1 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 6, God speaking to his people says, Wherever I have moved about with all Israel, have I ever spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel? And I want you to see this. Whom I commanded to shepherd my people, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now he's speaking to David. But I wanted you to see what God said. Whom I commanded to shepherd my people. God raised up the judges. Man didn't, God did. So God raised up Deborah. In Judges 4, verses 4 and 5, it says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife, the wife of Lapidoth. Now Lapidoth wasn't in the ministry, but she was. Was judging Israel at the time. And she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up for her for judgment. The only other judge in the Old Testament that had the distinction of being a prophet and being a Supreme Court justice was Samuel who anointed David. Deborah stands alone with Samuel in that privilege, and she was a woman. Let's look at another woman in the Old Testament. Her name was Huldah. When King Josiah, who was a king of Judah, was just a... A, a very young man when he came to the throne of God, and he was a righteous king, and he started a revival in Judah. And King Josiah found the book of the law that had been absolutely discarded, and it was in rubble in the temple, in Solomon's temple. And he found this book of the law, and he said, what shall we do? And the priests of that time said, we need to have it interpreted. It needs to be read, and we need to know what it says, because they had completely left the word of God. So we find... Huldah in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. Now, she was joined at that time by her contemporaries. Listen to this. Jeremiah, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Nahum, and other prophets lived in Jerusalem at that time. And yet, the priests wanted to go to Huldah to interpret the word of God. A woman. Are you with me? So, we'll just look quickly 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 14. So Hilkiah, the priest, Ahiakam, Akbor, Shepham, and Isaiah went to Huldah the prophetess. Again, she was married. The wife of Shalom, the son of Tikva, the son of whoever, keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in Jerusalem in the second quarter. And they spoke with her. And she said to them, thus says the Lord God of Israel, tell the man who sent you to me. Thus says the Lord. And she begins to prophesy to Josiah, and she tells him the word of the Lord. And you can read that later on. My point is, when God could have used a qualified prophet in Jerusalem, he chose to use a woman. Now, this is Old Testament. Now, my question is, if in the Old Covenant God used women... Now that we are new creations in Christ Jesus, now that the Holy Spirit has been poured out upon all flesh, now that your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your men's servants and your maid servants shall prophesy, when Jesus himself sent the first evangelist to go and tell, and she was a woman, Mary Magdalene, at the resurrection, right? A woman went to herald the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Go and tell Go and tell the men God used a woman. If in the Old Testament, when he could have used qualified men, he chose to use women, how much more in the New Covenant does God want to use 60% of the body of Christ today to go and tell and to do the work of the ministry? Are you with me? And what we've done is through our prejudice and through our interpretations, we have shackled a great part of the body of Christ. Now, in this church, there's an incredible freedom. There's an incredible liberty here. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I have to thank God for the leaders here and the men, the sons of God here that believe in the women of God 
and that have welcomed us and offered us a place alongside of them to serve in the body of Christ. And that is because we have strong men who love God, who love his word, and are not willing to shackle and to stop 60% of the body of Christ from doing what God has called them to do. So I wanted to just talk to you just about a few things about what we believe. What do we believe at The Rock? We believe that God chooses leaders by his standards, not ours. The role of women in ministry is directly determined by the anointing and the gifts of God that he has placed upon her individual life. God does not call the qualified. He qualifies the called. And he is the one that sets in order in his church men and women by the gifts and his anointing to serve the body of Christ for the work of the ministry, that the body of Christ can grow up to maturity and they go into the highways and byways. That's all of us to do the work of God. The miracles are to happen in the marketplace, in your homes, in your places of business, in the grocery stores. You carry the Holy Spirit. And the fivefold ministry gifts that are here in this church, the pastors and the teachers, are here to serve you and to help you grow strong so that God's anointing on your life can send you outside those doors into your mission field to touch the men and the women that will never touch or will never know. So we believe at The Rock that God chooses his leaders by his standards. We believe that we do this by faith, that ministers here at The Rock, pastors and leaders here at The Rock, we pastor by faith. We live by faith. Every day we live by faith. Every week we live by faith. It's a walk of faith to be a pastor in this house, to look at budgets, to do programs, to do all the things that go on here. It's by faith. Just like in your life, you do the work that God has called you to. We are all full-time ministers. Every one of us is a full-time minister. There's just shepherds and shepherdesses here where you may put on your costume and go be a nurse or a teacher or a mechanic. We just put on our clothes and we shepherd. But we're all ministers of the gospel and we do this by faith. And it's by faith that we receive the grace of God, God's power in me to do what God's truth demands of me, God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. The grace of God is what anoints us to get the job done and to get the job done for you in your life. So we serve by faith. Here, as leaders, we are under authority, just like in your life. God's a God of authority. So we believe here at The Rock that our leaders are under authority, that we follow our senior pastor and the pastors here as they follow Jesus. And we don't break rank. We stay in our spots. You see, here's where people get confused. Because there is different levels of authority in our world. There is spiritual authority, which is in the church, which is your pastors and your apostles and your prophets, that God sets them in motion to, to be over us, not to lord over us, but to serve us and to help us grow up. Then there's something called domestic authority. What does that mean? That means the husband is head of the wife, and she is to submit to her husband. Then there is corporate authority. Hey, if you've got a job, your boss is your authority, and you are under submission to his vision. If he's hired you, he's hired you to do a job, right? Then we have civil authority. What is that? Well, that means that there's laws in the land that we are to come under and obey, that there's governmental authority and civil authority, that there's authority in our schools. Our students are to come under the authority of the teacher. And there's civil authority. You see, there's different levels of authority. There's corporate there is spiritual, there is domestic, there is civil, and these are all different lines of authority. And just like Deborah was married to Lapidath, he was not a judge, she was. When she was in the home, he was her covering and her head. But when she sat under the palm tree and judged Israel, she was under the authority of God as the judge of Israel. Do you understand the difference? And so when we start to say, I am not under the authority of all men. Why? Because all men don't pay my bills. I'm under the authority of that man in domestic issues. He is my husband, my head. In the church, I am under spiritual authority. 
Outside of this church, I'm under governmental and civil authority. I better obey the laws. If I'm speeding on the freeway, I'm going to get a ticket because I'm breaking authority. Are you with me? And corporate authority on your jobs, you're under your boss. So we know that we are to be people under authority because God honors authority. He's a God of authority. He's a God of order. And in this church, the pastors in this church are under authority. The last thing I want to say is knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. You know, you can know a lot, you can study a lot, you can be all that. You know, in churches and in our culture and in our world, we have stars, celebrities. You have favorites. You may have a favorite preacher here. But you know, it's not so in the kingdom of God. God didn't set competition up like that. God made us a body. Every joint and every piece and every part fits together and works together. And so here at this church, we believe it's very important to be in our spot and to do our piece and our part and not to break rank, not to be in competition, and not to, in, not to be divisive in any way, but to build the house of God and the body of Christ through service. I had a lesson from Jesus this past couple weeks ago, and it was a, it was a definitely an illustrated message from the Holy Spirit. And I want to share with you about this. This is about shepherding and what we believe here at this house. Peter says, Ten, nurture, guard, guide, and fold the flock of God that is your responsibility, not by coercion or constraint, but willingly, not motivated by the advantages that belong to the office, but willingly, being examples to the congregation. For when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the shepherd's crown of glory. Shepherding, pastoring, is simply serving and loving and tending the flock of God any way we can, however we can, whenever we can, with whatever we have. And sometimes it can be a challenging job because sometimes the flock of God and the house of God doesn't really like you all that much. And sometimes you can feel like a failure. Sometimes you can feel like you're really worthless and you're really not doing much. Well, I was on a trip with my family. Pastor Luke and Stacy and Jim and I were in the Owens Valley, and then we went up to Mammoth. I grew up in the Owens Valley, and I had horses and cows and livestock, and I was a farm girl. And as we were up in Mammoth and we're, we're, we're having a day together, we decided to go to a ghost town called Bodie. And Bodie was a long dirt road. And Stacy's in the back seat, and I'm in the back seat, and Bjorn, their son, who's only just a year and a half old, was between us. And as we're going through this dirt road up to Bodie, this original historic California ghost town, she looks off to the side, and there's a whole flock of sheep in this field. As we're on this dirt road in this desert community, isolated community, there's a whole field of sheep. And she saw a sheep that was stuck in an irrigation ditch. Now, I don't know if you know what an irrigation ditch is, but... Up in the Owens Valley and up in the Mammoth area, there are huge ditches. They can be four feet deep. And water runs through them to water the meadows where the, where the sheep are going to graze and where the, the cattle are going to graze. Are you with me? So they, they, you can't even really see that they're an irrigation ditch. You'd have to almost be on top of it to see it because it blends in with the grass. But it's about, it can be four feet deep. Now, this was up in high elevations of about 8,000 feet. So it's below freezing at night, and that water is very cold. And as she looks out the window, she sees a sheep with its head sticking out of what looks to be an irrigation ditch. And she thought, oh, my gosh. And she mentioned it to us, and we said, oh, it's probably nothing. And, and so we go up to Bodie, and three hours later, we come back. And she said to us, if it's all right with you, if that sheep is still there, could we go check on it? And we said, sure. Thinking in our hearts, Jim and I probably, Ah, uh, you know, it's probably dead or whatever, dumb sheep. And so as we drive down this road, I'm now on the side where the irrigation ditch is, and she's on the other side, and I see the sheep. And sure enough, that sheep is caught in that ditch. 
Now, Jim stops the car, and Luke and Stacy run down this steep cliff to get to that sheep. Now, Stacy's going to have a baby in December, and I realize she can't be lifting any sheep out of an irrigation ditch. So I hightail it out of the car. Jim's stuck in the car with Bjorn so he can make sure Bjorn's okay. And we're all in this meadow right now, and there is this sheep. And we get down there, and we see that this sheep is stuck in an irrigation ditch. Now, I'm talking about pastoring, so stay with me. Because this was a message from Jesus to my heart. And this sheep is an ewe. She's a female sheep. She has a skinny head and she has a skinny forefront and she has this really wide back. Typical woman. <laughs> but she is so stuck in her back end that she can't get out. Now, she's been in that water for at least three hours because we saw her three hours ago and that water is sub-zero. We know that if we don't get her out of that irrigation ditch, she's not going to live. She's going to die. And this is a dumb sheep. This is a stupid sheep who got herself caught in an irrigation ditch. So there we are, and Luke's trying to get her out. And by the way, there was a shovel right next to the irrigation ditch. Just like, who put the shovel there? So this was such a setup. It was such a spiritual setup. Luke's trying to get her out, and she's not coming out. And, of course, Stacy can't even do anything. She's just encouraging Luke. And, and there I am. And finally the Lord, and I'm praying, and I'm saying, God, don't let the sheep die. Don't let the sheep die. I know you're saying something to us. So I get into the irrigation ditch. I actually get down in the ditch with the sheep, and I begin to reach underneath in the ditch, and I begin to pull her out. And Luke took the shovel, and together we lifted out her front end, but her back end is still stuck. So we worked, and we worked, and we worked, and we finally got this sheep unstuck in her back end. And Luke threw her up over the irrigation ditch onto the meadow. Now, I don't know if you've, we've got a, Jim was photographing this whole thing. So I don't know if we've got that. Okay. So that's the meadow. Now, see where that sheep is right there? Right behind her, or in front of her, is an irrigation ditch that's four feet deep. Now, that sheep had been in that ditch for so long, she was completely frozen. She couldn't move her legs. She couldn't move any extremity at all. So we had to rub her down, and we had to massage her, and we had to help her get feeling back into her legs because she couldn't move. So I'm there rubbing her down, and I'm just praying in the spirit over her, and I'm just doing all this stuff. And finally, after about 15 minutes, after about 15 minutes, she finally got up. We cheered and we said, Lord, thank you. And that dumb sheep took one look at us and she ran as fast as she could in the opposite direction. And we went after her and we herded her back to the shepherds that didn't even know she was caught in a ditch. And Jim took the car and went and found the shepherds and got their attention and they came and they collected her. Now, and that's just a very unusual thing to happen, don't you think? And the Spirit of God spoke to me, and he said, Child, you're going to have to remember, no matter how big your church gets, how hurt you get, or how much things change, you're going to have to get in the ditch with the sheep because they get stuck. They get stuck, and you've got to go after the one that's stuck. It's going to be hard to get them out. You're going to work hard. You can do everything you can to get them out of the ditch. And when you get them out of the ditch, then you're going to have to take care of them. You're going to have to stay with them until they can move again. Then, child, they're going to run away because they're scared. And they want to get as far away from you as they can. But you're going to have to hurt them and go after them and get them to me because I'm the shepherd of their soul. In church, that's what pastors do. So they get in the ditch with us. They get us unstuck. They counsel us. They love us. I was in the hospital today. In the, third, in the second service, Eleanor and I, Pastor Eleanor, I made a hospital call to a precious woman that if Jesus doesn't heal her, she's going to go home. She's stuck in a ditch. And we were there bringing the light of the gospel, bringing the goodness of God and the hope of God and the love of God. What a privilege it is to be a shepherd in the house of God and to love the flock of God, that God has paid such a price for. And no matter how 
what happens or how much you don't like us or you don't think we're this or we're that. We love you. We live to serve you. We live to help you. We live to help you get strong so you can go outside those doors and you can do the work of the ministry and do what God wants you to do in your generation. And as we anoint tonight these amazing women, they're not here to usurp authority. They're not here to lord over men. We women stay with the women most of the time. We found that when women counsel women, the men don't fall. What a thought. Let the older women teach the younger women to love their husbands, to love their children, to submit unto their own husbands, Titus said, to be discreet, that the word of God would not be blasphemed. When there's strong older women in the house that love the younger women and their strong families, that's Joanna and that's Pastor Tracy. And so tonight, we're going to do something amazing. We're going to actually lay hands on these women. We're going to set them into pastoring here at Iglesia La Roca. The Rock Church. And we're going to let Jesus have his way in this church. He's the one that appoints and anoints. He's the one that brings gifts to his people. I just want to end with this because this involves all of us. And it was just a little poem that Mother Teresa, who was my hero, wrote. And I, I read it all the time. And it's called Anyway. And listen to what she said. People are often unreasonable illogical and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. People may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it's between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. I need to ask one more thing of you before you go home tonight because I don't know everyone here. And I need to talk to you and ask you a question that you probably really don't want to think about, but it faces every one of us, and that is life and death. Like I said, today I was in a hospital room with a precious young woman that was facing life and death. She was at that season and at that time, and we were believing God for a miracle for her. She almost died the night before. And I, I need to ask you, if you were to walk out those doors tonight through no fault of your own, because life is fragile, if tonight were the last night that you had on planet Earth, if you were to die, where would you open your eyes? Would you open them in heaven, or would you open them in hell? Now, I know that this is a tough question. With no one looking around, this is just between you and God. But the question is, what makes you think that you're going to get into God's heaven? If you're thinking, well, I'm hoping I get to heaven. I've got to talk to you because God says hopers don't get into heaven. If you're thinking, well, okay, I've been good. I've changed my behavior. I've got to talk to you because God doesn't say that behavior modification and behavior gets you to heaven. You're thinking, well, good people go to heaven. I'm good. I'm going to heaven. I haven't killed anybody. I haven't done anything really wrong. I'm good. Good people go to heaven. I have to talk to you because God doesn't say that good people go to heaven. He said, as a matter of fact, your goodness, humanity's goodness, is like a filthy rag to God. Because here's the deal is if you and I compare ourselves to each other, our goodness can look pretty good. But God says that's not the litmus test, and that's not the plumb line. The test is me. And in comparison to me, your goodness is like a filthy rag. So I can't hope my way into heaven. I can't behave my way into heaven. And I can't be good enough for heaven because that will never happen. And God knew that humanity could not 
get to heaven on their own. That is why God knew that the only way we could get to his heaven was if he stepped out of eternity, wrapped himself in flesh, and came to us. And God said, the way to my heaven is one way and one way only. There is only one way and one road. And God said, you must be born again. Now, in this sophisticated, logical, scientific culture, we have mocked the word of God and we have mocked God. As a matter of fact, many have said there is no heaven. There is no hell. We are gods to ourselves. Well, how convenient. But that's not what this book says. And God is either God and true or he's not. And God said you must be born again. What does that mean, born again? Jesus explained it very succinctly to a great man of God named Nicodemus one dark Jerusalem night when Nicodemus for fear of the Jews came at night to Jesus and said to him how do I get to heaven and Jesus with all sincerity of heart looked at Nicodemus and he said Nicodemus you're a teacher of the law and you don't know you must be born again Nicodemus said to Jesus oh, that's crazy I'm, I'm an old man I can't I can't get into my mother's womb again Jesus looked at him and said Nicodemus what is born of the spirit is spirit. What is born of the flesh is flesh. And he had him hear the wind. The wind must have been blowing that night. And he said, you, see, you, you can't see the wind, but you can see where it's going. Even so was everyone born of the spirit. What was he saying? God is a spirit. You and I have eternity in our hearts. We live in flesh, but our spirit is eternal. And your spirit and my spirit is going to separate from this body one day. And how do I get to heaven? And my spirit must be born again not my flesh but my spirit well how does that happen and Jesus began to explain to Nicodemus in John the third chapter he said Nicodemus I'm going to a cross I'm the only one qualified all God and all man I am the only one qualified to get on that cross and take the penalty and the punishment for your sin and the sin of this world I lay my life down on that cross, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. In other words, Nicodemus, if you'll look to the cross, and if you'll look to that cross and surrender your life, let me be Savior and let me be Lord. I'll bring you out of the kingdom of darkness. I'll join your spirit back to the Father, and you will be born again. If you've never looked at that cross, and you've never made a decision, and you've never said it's either true or it isn't, it's either all or nothing and you've surrendered your life I'm talking to you because this isn't about being in and out of the body of Christ and of the kingdom of God this isn't about being a re religious person because America is very religious 80% of America says they're Christians and that's a farce this isn't about spewing out of our mouths that we believe in Jesus everybody believes in Jesus the devil believes in Jesus and he's not going to heaven this is about men and women looking at that cross coming to grips with the reality of life and death, understanding that there is life after death, and where am I going to spend it? Hell is a real place. Jesus talked about it, and God didn't make you for hell, and he didn't make me for hell. He made us for heaven in his image, but we were separated by sin. And Jesus said, you must be born again. You must look at that cross and make your choice. You see, God's already gone to the cross for us, but he's a gentleman and he will not force salvation on anyone. It's my choice whether to say yes to him or no. So tonight, all over this auditorium, have you looked at that cross? Have you made a decision? Have you surrendered all of your heart and all of your life? Because if you haven't, God brought you here tonight to make that choice. All over this auditorium, maybe some of you have said yes to Jesus, but you backslid and you were in and you were out and you were up and you were down and you don't trust yourself and you're disgusted with yourself, but you're here tonight. Jesus brought you here tonight to get right with him and to come back to him. Call backslidden Christians home tonight. You can't save yourself, but he can. And I found out there's this amazing God that we love and serve that made us in his image. He's not willing that we stay in the ditch. He's the shepherd of our souls, and he's here to get us out. So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life, I'm talking to you. If you're not sure about where you're at, I'm talking to you. Get right with God tonight. 
And this is what we're going to do very quickly with heads up and eyes open. Because Jesus said, if you confess me before my father, before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In this house, we're serious about our faith. I'm just going to ask in just a moment that we're just going to raise our hands. If you need to get right with God, we'll do it all together with heads up and eyes open. You said, I'm going to be embarrassed. I don't want to do that. No, maybe you don't want to, but you know you must. This isn't about being embarrassed. This is about saying yes to Jesus Christ. If you can't say yes in this safe place that loves you, how can you walk out those doors and live in a hostile world that doesn't believe? So if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've been a rascal, listen, I know rascals. I was a rascal, a drug dealer, everything else in my other life so many years ago. God takes the broken and the unqualified and the sheep in the ditch, and he cleans us up and he gives us a new life. If you've never, never said yes to him, I'm pleading with you tonight. Look to that cross and say yes to Jesus. I'm going to count to three. I'm just going to hit my Bible like this, bang, and I'm just going to ask you to lift your hands all together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands. If you need to get right with God, I see that hand. Hold them high. I see that hand. Let me see your hands. I see that hand. I see that hand. There can't be more than a couple hundred people here tonight. It's a very small service. I see that hand, but I see hands everywhere. God, he loves us. Who are we that God would step out of eternity, put himself in flesh, die for us, and then call us home and give us the kingdom of God and the family business and make us brand new people? Who are we? But this love, how would you not want it? Anybody else need to get right? Anybody else? Forgive these squeaky tears of this grandma. This is what we're going to do. We're just going to stand. If you raise your hand, I want you to gather what you brought to church with you, and I want you to slip out of the aisles and just meet me right here in front. If you didn't raise your hand and you wish you would have, it's not too late as we sing this song. Just come quickly. Let's get right with God. Let's get right with God. He loves you. He's not mad at you. Just quickly come. Quickly come. Oh, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Quickly come. still coming. It's not too late. You just come. Just come. They're still coming. Let's give them time. Get your cute little bums down here. Let's get right with God tonight. Come on, sweetheart. Just come on down. Okay, smile at me. You're not going to a funeral. You're actually going to go to life. He loves you. And you're in for the greatest adventure. He loves you. He's the only one that can fix it. And he loves you. This is Pastor Dave. What we're going to do is we're going to pray with you, but we're not going to pray with you here. We want to just take you to our beautiful little room and pray with you and explain some things to you so you know what you're doing, okay? So if you will just make a, what is this, a turn? There you go. 